I'm going to go back to a guy that, that you mentioned earlier and just, you know, he's one of the best people I think in Houston sports, not, you know, up there as far as one of the great players, but Dan Pastorini, uh, just one of the fantastic personalities, you know, I've had a chance to interview him on the podcast, but you became friends with him. Well, yeah, unfortunately I became too good of friends with him and that led to a very bad situation, which I'm sure most of your listeners that know anything about me or him would probably remember. But that, that was also a very, a very teachable moment for me is you really can't become friends with the people you cover. T- take me through that because well, that, that'd think, be another two hours, but, but, uh, but you for, you know, 40, it's been 40 years ago. So a lot yeah. of people, if you're younger than 40, 40, you have no, yeah, no idea about this. The, the, uh, yeah, we, um, it was the apex of love you blue, the 1979 season. Uh, they, they'd come off the AFC championship game appearance, uh, the previous year in Pittsburgh. And, uh, when Dan came back that summer for the training camp in San Angelo, summer of 1979, there was something terribly wrong with his arm. Anybody could see that. He couldn't throw a football. This is a guy who could throw a football 80 yards, you know, in, in, in dead spiral down straight down the field. Now was having a hard time hitting guys on, on little quick outs 10 yards. You know, I mean, something was wrong. And either the Oilers, including my friend Bum, and Dan himself were lying about it, but their, their argument is they, didn't, weren't, they, 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 they thought he'd strained something. It was always this very, very vague thing, but it was just pretty obvious what, there was something terribly wrong there. And if it didn't get fixed – the season was not going to go well. So uh, as, as the training camp wore on and preseason games, it, it wasn't getting any better. At one point, in fact, that summer in San Angelo, one of the things Dan was doing to try to strengthen the shoulders, he was going water skiing on a lake uh, near, the tra- near San Angelo State to try to strengthen, you know, because water skiing requires shoulder, you know, a lot of shoulder strength. Right. And, and I was a water skier, and, I, I mean, I literally went out with them a couple of days. Carl Mock drove the boat, and Dan and I water skied, okay? And how crazy is that? But in a bar at night, I'd sit there and drink with him. He was pretty astute in terms of me. He understood that if he could cultivate a reporter, he was going to – and it had worked really well up to this point, except now he can't throw a football. And I told him as a friend, I said, Dan, I want to give you some cover here. There's something wrong here. I mean, you know, because if there isn't something wrong, you're done. I don't know what's happened. And, and he thought by my writing about it, the more I wrote about it, the weaker was going to make him, the opponents would have seen that there was a huge problem. But I said, Dan, that's crazy. They're watching, they're, they're looking at your film. film. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm not, I, I, I'm trying to tell people that you're hurt. And the, and the, and because the fans are getting really like, what the hell's wrong with Pastorini, right? But he was headstrong. I was headstrong. And we just never could, you know, the situation got worse and worse and worse to the point that, you know, he yelled at me after the final preseason game and says, you're trying to ruin my career. And I said, I am not. I am trying to help you, et cetera. But being stubborn, you know, I made no efforts to fix it. You know, he clearly wasn't going to. I mean, you know, need to say he was he was the alpha male in this situation. <laughs> I'm not that's not breaking news. Yeah. And and the Oilers, you know, the. the what I should have done in retrospect is gone to Bum and said, Bum, we got to get this fixed. But, you know, I, I felt like that'd be crying on the head coach's shoulder. And, I, you know, and again, I was, I was, you know, I had my hands crossed across my chest, harumph, you know, screw him. No, screw you. Ah, blah, blah, blah. So I, I, I made no effort. That was totally on me, big, huge mistake. I mean, I'd, I'd, today I'd have gotten it fixed within a week. Or if it wasn't fi- fixable, at least we'd have tried, right? So it just got worse and worse. And then uh, late in the season, he was starting to play better. But uh, unfortunately, uh, one of the guys that was not profiting from his improvement was a tight end, Mike Barber, who has now become a somewhat beloved figure in his own right, prison minister and all that. But Mike was quite a rounder in those days, too. And it turns out that he and Dan were actually, uh, shall we say, attracted to the same woman. And when one day in a story, for a story, I went to Barber and said, oh, so why aren't you getting to ball more? And he, and he totally unloaded on Dan. And I didn't know there was a personal relationship, you know, I would, I, you know, so, but when the story ran and that, that's when things really went south. And so at that point, Pastor Ernie would refuse to talk to me and, and, and often wouldn't even do it, wouldn't even do a group interview if he saw me in the group. So right before the AFC championship game, Pastor Ernie had not played the previous week in San Diego, nor had Earl, nor had Kenny Burrow, which made that probably the single greatest upset in Houston sports history to beat the Chargers in San Diego without those three guys. But I needed a quote for a story on whether, how Pastor Ernie felt. So I got it from a, a young uh, radio guy named um, uh, Chris Begala, who's Paul Begala's uh, younger brother, by the way. He became a strategist in the Clinton administration, you know, prominent political. But Chris was, Chris was a great bug, great kid, great kid. I said, hey, man, just let me listen to your tape. And so we sat down, and he played the tape for me. And, I, you know, today, of course, I say, 
told KL, KILT Radio. I mean, but no, I just took it as a quote for myself. And, and I told the young man that I got it from, look, I'm not giving you credit for this. I just need this. And I'll do you a favor. You know, I'll, you know, I'll buy lunch. And I'll buy you a burger next week, right? Because I think Chris was only like 16 years old at the time. He was really just a intern wandering around out there, right? <laughs> so the story runs. And, and next day, next day, now the national media on a Thursday has, has come to Houston. And this is before the, you know, so before the big press conference where Mom's going to talk, Dan's going to talk, Earl's going to talk. I'm in the locker room. And, and this, is, this is where the story really tells you how the world has changed. I'm actually in the training room. Now, can you imagine today being in the training room with the Texans? You'd you get tasered. I mean, yeah. They would taser you. They wouldn't kill you, but they would at least taser you. But I'm in the training room talking to Elvin Bethay, who's sitting in the ice tub, and, and Pastorini comes in. Is this the same ice tub that Barry Warner got thrown uh, into? I do believe it was. <laughs> I do believe it was. Now, in fact, I'm sure it was, because Bud never bought anything new, and that was, a, that, that was the rattiest, most sorry training facility on this planet, that a team could actually get almost to the Super Bowl working out of something like that was an embarrassment. That's on Bud, another story. Anyway, so Dan starts jawing at me, and I start jawing back. Rather than letting it go, he keeps going, and I keep following him, and I'm shaking my finger at him, and – you know, and it, and it continues as we walk into this little Quonset hut portable school room where they're doing the press conference. That's kind of what the facilities were like. Just as we walk through the door, as I as I recall, I mean, there, there are a couple versions of it. I mean, it, it all became a blur after that. But but I I do remember I I I, I called him a prima donna asshole. That that's what came out of my mouth just as we entered the room where there are about 30, 30, 40 reporters gathered, and everybody in the room, you know, turn all the heads turn. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's that, there's that, you know, in a movie, there's that frozen moment. You know, you, if you looked at Pastorini, you can start to see the smoke coming. And, and, and had we not been in the press conference room, I don't know what would have happened. But in no way was he going to let this pipsqueak reporter call him a prima donna asshole in front of the national media. I mean, it, he processed this. Okay. So he grabbed me. I was, I was wearing this kind of weird vest, you know, this old cowboy vest, because we all tried to dress like bum. You know, we all wanted to all be part of the team. <laughs> And he grabbed me, and I, he threw me up against perhaps thinking he was throwing me up against the wall. What would happen there, I don't know. But he threw me up against the door we had just come in, which released. And so we went tumbling out like a couple of clowns, you know, out onto the little the landing out there. I mean, literally just rolled out the door like it was. <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> now, understand, this is three days before the AFC I'm, just I'm trying to envision this. With, vision it today. With the, the, Deshaun Watson. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'll try to yeah, put it in modern context. And, uh, and, and, and I kid you not, I landed on bum Phillips boot. Okay. Yeah. Which probably saved me from a concussion. Really? Yeah. I mean, cause otherwise I'd hit my head on the, on, on the, on the wood landing. Okay. And, and, and I, I am not making this up. Bum is standing there having an interview with John Clayton, who we came to know as the professor, the old professor on ESPN. Right. Right. But John Clayton is also a young reporter, probably my age. You know, he's come down from Pittsburgh. He's working for the Pittsburgh, one of the Pittsburgh papers. And he's asking Bum about this incredible symbiotic relationship in Houston, Texas, we, between the team and the, and, and, the, and, and the, you know, the fans and the media and, the, you know, this, you know, the cowboy thing and all that. How does all, you know, and Bum was going on about this. We had this, you know, everybody, blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, uh, uh, Dale Robertson is now on the ground on his boot with, with his quarterback, has his fist back ready to, and bum looks down and goes till now what the hell's going on <laughs> and at that point dan was pulled off of me so there was no uh, which is which so the story ends there but it things things got a little weird thereafter in terms of you know let's just, that, that's the football side of it let's just leave it there and move, move on but that that but having said that it, but okay Getting back to your original point, this was a long digression. The reason Dan couldn't throw the football is because he had taken so many shots. He, played, he was playing with three broken ribs in the playoffs the previous year that they, they basically destroyed the nervous system in his shoulder. Okay? And the only reason today, of course, Deshaun Watson might, might, might take a bus ride to um, uh, Jack, Jacksonville to play a game, but no way on earth a player today would allow this to happen to him. Dan, by God, after all he'd been through in Houston, was not going to be deprived of a chance to go to the Super Bowl. So he, he said, keep shooting me. And he played well in, in that playoff until Pitts, Pittsburgh was a disaster. But, that, you know, but you know, again, again, Miami and New England, the two previous games, he was really good. But in Pittsburgh, things fell apart. Maybe the arm at that point was coming apart. But that's, that's why it happened. 
it was his toughness and his desire and his, you know, he, he loved that football team. And he was the spiritual leader of the team. He was. He felt an obligation. You know, he basically ruined his career to do that because that's because ultimately that, that, you know, that, well, even indirectly, truthfully, I think Bum did trade him because of our incident. I thought he, I think Bum thought that Dan was unstable, that this, under any circumstances, this should not have happened. And he had a chance to get Kenny Stabler. And Kenny Stabler had had a lot of success against the Pittsburgh Steelers. But if Dan and I don't go tumbling out the door, I'm not sure that Dan would have been traded. And, and it, it, you know, and I will say this for Dan, though, and it because it, 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 his career, you know, was pretty much over at that point. He broke his leg in Oakland and ended up being a backup in Philly and L.A., and that was the end of it. But I, I, I saw Dan – in a restaurant in 1984, this four years after this happened, he saw me, and at that point I'm going, you know what, he may come over here and this may turn into another ugly scene. He came over, stuck his hand out and said, hey, just want to say hi to an old friend. And that was the end of it. And but only maybe two or three years ago do we actually talk it out, and now I fully understand why the arm had gone bad. You know, it's still unclear as to whether they knew fully what they were doing to him when they did it. Or, and But he fully admitted, he said, look, man, they could I, I didn't care. I had to play. I wanted to play. He's the toughest son of a bitch I ever covered. I'll put it that way. Because I know what he went through before I covered him. And it wasn't even great, you know, when I was covering him. They still didn't have a great offensive line. You know, they lost Greg Sampson, who could have been an all-pro to a weird injury and et cetera. There were a lot of comings and goings. And, but Dan – Dan played. He played. He played hurt, and, and he never complained, and, and he never owned up to being hurt. So, yeah. Most interesting guy that you that you cover. I mean, this is somebody that, I mean, we talked. I've talked a little bit about it on the show, but, you know, this is somebody that, you know, was, was racing boats. He ended up being a drag racer. You know, he was dating and engaged to Playboy Playmates. No, he's he, married. He, was married. he was married to Jim Wilkinson, who was uh, probably, one of the, probably the most famous uh, Playboy Playmate of the 1960s. She and she was like twenty, nineteen, twenty years older than he was too, <laughs> and, and, and dated Farrah Fawcett uh, during his time briefly, with the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, 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 no, he did. He, yeah, Dan, Dan, Dan passed during your life story was. Um, let's just say he lived large. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Large, but, uh, the, 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 but the guy had a big heart, and I would have tremendous regret today if that had never gotten fixed. But it didn't even require fixing ultimately, because you know he, he was a bigger man than that, and. Uh, he said, you know, I'm sorry a lot of that happened, and but let's just get on down the road. So I'll oh, kudos him. I'm not sure I would have ever taken the step. You feel like, I mean, the next few years of your career, did that sort of follow you around? Was it frustrating for you to that that sort of happened all publicly? The only thing that was frustrating is because there were, there were, there were some elements in Houston at that time that really wanted to, really wanted to do me personal harm because, you know, uh, you know, it was kind of it was kind of a shadowing of what's happening right now in this god awful political environment we're in today. Uh, a couple of folks, uh, you know, went on the radio, and went on television, and you know, said, "You know, this guy's trying to ruin your football team." Did you get threats after this? About a hundred death threats. Hundred death. By threats. the time the night, by the time the night was over, I had to have a police escort home. Wow. Very, very funny story, though, and you know, a great story because I want to throw this guy's name in here. Kirk Logan, the managing editor of the Houston Post at the time, he gets a call from uh, Mrs. Hobby. At nine o'clock that night, when all hell's breaking loose, the building, the building's also, you know, having to be surrounded by squad cars because people are going to come up there and storm the building. I know it was awful; it was bad, but it wasn't because it was because of what was being said by a couple of individuals. And I'm just going to leave their names out of this because I don't like talking about them. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so so Mrs. Mrs. Hobby calls uh, calls Kirk and says, "Kirk, I don't know what's going on down there, but you got to fucking just fire this guy. <laughs> we, we don't need this because at this point, the post is already started in that start of in its." downward slide that's ultimately lends to you know ends the paper ends up folding of course many years later but i mean they there were concerns at the time and and she obviously was looking at it you know ad revenues i mean this could really be bad and this is hobby, hobby sold it i think just like four, four four years later or something yeah actually that's correct yeah yeah so just kirk just fire him when you I mean, just, please and and kirk logan the guy that i hadn't really had a close relationship with nice guy but i you know really hadn't interacted much with him he said well mrs hobby it's complicated. I mean, yeah, he, he made some mistakes here, uh, but he's a really good young reporter, and he's you know he's just you know he doesn't deserve this. I mean, this 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 is not his, what's happening right now is not his fault. And she kind of explained to her because she didn't really know what was going on. And uh, it, it, she said, "I just can't do that. It's just, it's not right." And, and and she persisted, and he persisted, and finally, finally he said, "Well, Mrs. Hobby, okay, you 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 know I work for you. I'll fire him, but then I'm resigning." That's big. <laughs> and 
and you know, and Kirk told me this himself. And he has no reason, you know, he's not with us anymore. But wonderful man. He ended up becoming the publicist for the entire medical center. That was his final professional role. So she goes, well, well Kirk, I can't afford to lose you. And she says, well, will you, will you at least tell him to get a haircut? Because, you know, you know, I probably should have prefaced this. At the time, I had, you know, what we called in the day a white man's afro. And, and it had been, it, it, it was on steroids that day because it was a stupidly windy day. And I literally was on my way to get a haircut, but ran, was running late and thought, I can't, can't be late to the facility, so I didn't get the haircut. And the wind was blowing, so my hair was, you know, sticking out like, you know, I, I looked like, you know, you, but you're, you picture you're, somebody in a fright wig. You're in your 20s, and it's... It, it, that was the is, times. Well, that's the times, yeah. Well, that was this. Would you please tell him to get a haircut? <laughs> 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 because I was on all over. Uh, two of the two of the stations, 11 and 13, had had, had actually had live video. Like 13 is, had the video. But something's happened to the video. I'm, I'm told it got destroyed somehow, accidentally. But there, there was... So anytime there was ever an altercation between... Yeah, I feel for, like for I decades, saw it. For decades. In fact, if you, if you Google me right right now, you will and say, Dan Pastor, Dale Robertson, fight, you will probably see a photo that ran that was the entire back page of the New York Daily News the next day with me on the ground and Pastor and his fist reared back. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I've seen that. And I, I feel like I saw the video w- when it happened back in... I mean, hey, I was a little kid at the time. But. I'm, not pr- I'm not proud that it happened, obviously, because I mean, I, 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 I was as, made as many mistakes as Dan did in this period. That was it. We, this was this was this was this was on both of us. It's on both of us. But the, what, the best thing that came out of it was a lot of old, famous old sports writers around the country who didn't know me from Adam all rallied around me. And in every press box I was in for the next three years, if I was in, if I was in L.A., a Jim Murray would come over and talk to me, a Blackie Sheridan Dallas uh, Will McDonough, who you know, ended up actually winning a fight against Raymond Claiborne, <laughs> he actually knocked Play- <laughs> Claiborne silly, became my best friend. And all these guys, you know, they, they, they came up and put their arms around me and said, hey, kid, we're, we got your back. You know, you know, you know, maybe you didn't do the right thing here, but this ain't right. And, and, and frankly, I have to say, another guy who did that, who actually came up to me in the locker room the next day in Pittsburgh, because I got on a flight, thank God, the next morning for Pittsburgh, which had already been planned. A lot of people thought I was fleeing. But in those days, we didn't have the resources to send what we called advanced guys. So I, I, I flew to Pittsburgh for their stuff on Friday. I walked into the Steelers locker room. Terry Bradshaw came over to me and just said, hey, come here a minute. And he says, you know, and he put his arm around. I didn't, I didn't know Bradshaw other than having, you know, been around him in press conferences and stuff. And he said, yeah, he says, you know, I'm sorry that happened. That wasn't right. Uh, Dan's a good guy, but he just, nah, that, that was completely inexcusable. And I just want you to know on behalf of, you know, national football league players, you know, we apologize. That was Terry Bradshaw. You know, completely unsolicited. I just kind of went, oh, well, th- geez, thanks, Terry. <laughs> thanks, Terry. And those guys really admired the, the Oilers and Bum. Too, no, they, they, well. The teams had a great mutual respect. And that's why I say at that point they had a great mutual respect because the Oilers had kicked their ass in that last regular season game. The score wasn't bad, but they had physically beaten them up. And John Clayton probably, every time he saw you, probably said, I'm, d- I'm trying to do an interview. Stay away from me, Dale. Yeah, Cla- <laughs> Needless to say, Clayton and I became great friends. <laughs> See, that's been a long, strange ride. You're listening to Houston Sports Talk.